I am very happy to be here today and happy to introduce my friends Isabella and Barbara. And we're here to give you a presentation that covers the environmental aspects of what we're eating. And the information that we're giving is from the book, come in book, Eating Earth. How's that? So Eating Earth has three chapters and each of us is gonna take one of those chapters. The first one being on land animals, the second one being on hunting, and the third one being on water systems. And with that, take it away, Isabella. Um, everybody seeing my presentation? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, hold on. Hang on. I'm getting there. Hi, honey. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you for inviting me to participate in this super important panel. Um, and thank you, everyone who's attending. Um, my name is Isabella La Roca Gonzalez. I'm an artist and writer, and I'm here to talk to you about the environmental impacts of farming animals. Um, this is a photograph from my series, Censored Landscapes. I took this photograph on a day when the temperature topped 116 degrees Fahrenheit. After just 20 minutes out of my air conditioned car, my face was brick red and I felt lightheaded. Calf number 71901 was imprisoned on a feedlot along with thousands of others. The industry name for feedlots and other animal exploitation facilities is CAFO, Confined Animal Feeding Operation. Most people call them factory farms. 99% of meat, dairy, and eggs comes from animals on factory farms. Feedlots imprison cattle by the thousands for the beef or dairy industries. The animals are young, rarely over two years old. They are fed an unnatural grain diet to fatten them as quickly as possible, which can cause gastric distress. They have been painfully dehorned, branded, and or castrated with no requirements for anesthesia. They stand on or lie on barren excrement covered dirt all day and night, day after day. They have no real shade and only water from a dirty concrete tub to drink. Ammonia fumes sear their eyes, nostrils, mouths, and tongues. By now it's con common knowledge that human consumption of beef and dairy is a major contributor to global warming. People joke that it's because of cow farts and belches. Enteric fermentation, as it's called, is part of the problem. Enteric fermentation releases methane, a greenhouse gas that's 80, that's eight zero, 80 times more powerful than carbon dioxide at warming the earth in the first 20 years. As most of us know, carbon dioxide has far exceeded safe levels and has been blamed from, for global warming. This is a graph that illustrates sources of methane in the US, 27% of methane emissions comes from farmed animal enteric fermentation and another 10% from farmed animal manure. That's 37% from farming animals, more than the 30% from the gas and oil industries and more than a third of all methane emissions. If humans were to stop farming animals, we could slow the rate of global warming almost immediately, and it would cost much less than any other climate change mitigation strategy, including solar panels, wind farms, or electric cars. But methane is only part of the problem. Pee and poo from cows raised for beef and dairy create hot spots. Oops, sorry for the emission of carbon dioxide, which is already far above safe levels. Manure also emits nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is a greenhouse gas that's even more potent than methane or carbon dioxide. Nitrous oxide warms the atmosphere some 300 times more than carbon dioxide. 80% of the Amazon rainforest 
Deforestation is due to beef. Forests are the lungs of our planet, but humans are clear cutting forests. And for what? For the production of beef. The left side of the circle over here in this graph shows that ranchers graze their cattle on 155 million acres of public lands. Almost half of the public lands managed by the Bureau of Land Management. The program costs American taxpayers as much as $1 billion a year. The permits cost the ranchers less than the administrative cost to American taxpayers to run the program, and only a tiny fraction of what it would cost them to lease private lands. Wild horses are also killed to accommodate cattle ranchers. On public land leased to cattle ranchers, native species such as elk, which are essential for the local ecosystems, must compete with cattle for food. In 2021, Wildlife Services, an arm of the United States Department of Agriculture killed 1.7 million wild animals. Wildlife Services extend, exterminates wild animals primarily for the benefit of private cattle ranchers. Many of the animals they've killed are native species, again, crucial for local ecosystems. A 2016 investigation by Christopher Ketchum of Harper's Magazine reported, and I quote, wildlife services gunned down coyotes from airplanes and helicopters. Its trappers used poison baits, cyanide traps, leg hole traps, and neck snares. They hauled coyote pipe pups from dens with lengths of barbed wire, strangled them, or clubbed them. Sometimes they set the animals on fire in their dens or suffocated them with explosive cartridges of carbon monoxide, end quote. Ketchum's sources were former wildlife services agents who have witnessed or participated in these practices themselves. But what about grass-fed beef, you might ask? Isn't that environmentally friendlier? Nope. The difference between raising grass-fed cattle and raising cattle by the feedlot method is only a matter, matter of how the animals spend the last five months of their lives on average. All cattle raised for beef graze on forage and grass until they are up to about a year old. The slaughtering methods are just as atrocious for all cattle, including grass-finished cattle. And producing grass-fed beef is even less sustainable than producing grain-finished beef. Producing the same amount of grass-fed beef as all the beef currently sold in the U.S. would require three times the land. And because grass-finished cattle take longer to reach slaughter weight, they require more water, feed, and other resources, and they emit even more methane and other greenhouse gases. So maybe the solution is to eat chickens or turkeys. Think again. Carbon emissions caused by a single serving of poultry are estimated to be at least 11 times higher than a serving of beans. And if you don't think beans are as tasty as animal flesh, you haven't had a good Italian pasta fagioli or some yummy Mexican frijoles de olla or some scrumptious Cuban moros y cristianos or some delicious Indian dal or some good old American cowboy caviar. Farming chickens and turkeys, unlike growing beans, is almost unspeakably cruel. This photograph is also from my series Censored Landscapes. Part of the research I did was to find out how many animals were imprisoned in the facilities I photographed. On this farm alone, there were almost 350,000 animals. Cathos such as this one expose animals, workers, and nearby communities to high levels of hydrogen sulfide, antibiotic res residue, and particulate matter. So what about the other white meat, a phrase marketers have used to refer to products made from pigs? It's difficult to know where to start. 
Farming pigs has many of the same environmental impacts as other farmed animal products and is just as cruel. 70% of grain grown in the US is fed to farmed animals. Grain is grown as monocultures and duocultures, which require large amounts of fertilizers derived from fossil fuels, as well as poisonous pesticides and herbicides. These chemicals then leach into our waterways, affecting the health of marine animals and often killing them. And growing grains to feed animals to feed humans is extremely inefficient. Consuming animal products rather than eating the grains directly wastes 80 to 90% of the protein in grains. In light of the fact that the American diet is lacking in fiber, which leads to digestive diseases, heart disease, and some cancers, consider that consuming animal products also wastes about 100% of the fiber and carbs of the grains grown to feed farmed animals. This image shows how animal, an animal-based diet requires 14 times the land of a plant-based diet. If everyone ate a plant-based diet, five billion football fields or six and a half billion acres of land could be returned to forests. This would go a long way towards addressing global warming, habitat loss, loss of biodiversity and species extinction among other destruction caused by farming animals. Land is just one of the many resources wasted by farming animals. Pictured here is a CAFO where pigs are imprisoned for the pork industry. Farming pigs is particularly egregious when it comes to poop. Like the waste from cattle, pig manure is hugely problematic. Farmed animal waste is stored in lagoons which is what you see here next to the warehouses where the pigs are confined. But unlike human waste, farmed animal waste is not treated. And though the EPA has the authority to regulate it, in practice, farmed animal waste goes largely unregulated. Lagoons contain pesticides, herbicides, and other chemicals, as well as antibiotic residue and even dead animals. Runoff from lagoons ends up in lakes, streams, rivers, and oceans. Among other destruction, agricultural runoff causes marine dead zones and algal blooms, which kill marine life. Lagoons produce greenhouse gases, including nitrous oxide, which as we've said, has 300 times the global warming potential as carbon dioxide. Lagoons also poison nearby communities. One pig, produces four times the waste of an adult human. And in 2017, pig farming alone produced as much as half the waste of the US population. Again, unlike human waste, farmed animal waste is not treated and is mostly unregulated. What about eggs? A 2023 study by scientists at the University of Oviedo found that the carbon footprint of eggs is similar to that of other products of animal origin, such as dairy. CAFOs are disproportionately located in disadvantaged communities where people of color and poor people live. According to a study by scientists at Yale and Notre Dame universities, people with higher exposure to CAFOs were at a greater risk for respiratory disease, anemia, kidney disease, and cardiovascular disease because of the pollutants caused by the intensive confinement of animals. Producing dairy is almost also enormously wasteful and polluting for many of the same reasons as producing products from any other animal. If you think about it, consuming dairy products is thoroughly disgusting. Why would an adult consume breast milk? Why would a human consume the breast milk of another species? Eating local is good. As you can see from the top part of the blue part of the graph, buying local reduces emissions from food, packaging, transport, and processing. But as you can see from the rest of the graph, <clears throat> a plant-based diet reduces much more, including emissions from food, crops, and land. 
According to a study by scientists at Carnegie Mellon University, a plant-based diet is a much more effective means of lowering an average household's climate footprint than buying local. The thing is, farming animals, whether cows or pigs or chickens or turkeys or goats or sheep or rabbits or pigeons or fishes is a leading cause of climate change, air and water pollution, deforestation, ocean acidification, habitat destruction, loss of biodiversity and mass species extinction. The most effective thing any individual can do to mitigate climate change is to stop consuming animals. A plant-based diet is also kinder and healthier, a win-win-win. For example, producing any plant-based milk, whether rice milk or soy milk or oat milk or almond milk or cashew milk or hemp milk, emits fewer greenhouse gases. And plant-based milk requires much less land and even the much vilified almond milk requires less water. Also, plant-based milks are healthier for humans and most certainly healthier for animals. So here we are, purportedly the most intelligent species on earth, wasting the earth's resources to breed, confine, and slaughter innocent sentient animals, the consumption of wheat which makes us and the planet sick. And for what? so we can heat up the earth and make it more of a hell for the very animals we are breeding, confining, and slaughtering in order to waste the plants we grow and heat up the earth. A vicious cycle that will not end well. Climate change poses an existential threat to much of life on earth. July 2023 was the hottest month on record. According to UN Secretary Antonio Guterres, the era of global warming has ended and the era of global boiling has arrived. We are in a crisis situation and we must do everything we can to address it. This graph shows the exponential rise and extinction of species since the Industrial Revolution. We have entered the sixth mass extinction. The previous five were caused by natural phenomena. This one was caused by human activity. A quarter of all species on earth face extinction. Every single day, eating a plant-based diet saves 1,100 gallons of water, 20 pounds of carbon dioxide, 300 square feet of forest, 45 pounds of grain, and the life of one innocent animals. Humans do not need to eat animals to survive and thrive. If we did, I'd be dead. According to numerous peer-reviewed studies, a plant-based diet is much healthier than an animal-based diet for humans, for animals, and for the planet. Homo sapiens have existed at least 300,000 years, but we have only been farming animals less than 12,000 years a bizarre blip on this end of the human timeline. And on this continent, animal farming was virtually non-existent until about 400 years ago, a blink of an eye in human history. Before the arrival of European colonizers, North and Central Americans did not farm animals. The settler colonialists brought cows, pigs, sheep, goats, and chickens to the Americas, along with a legacy of white supremacy and the ownership, exploitation, and pollution of the land. Speciesism is foundational to virtually every form of oppression that people visit on each other and is very much bound up with our despoliation of the earth. Speciesism is the assumption that humans are superior to other animals and entitled to exploit and oppress them. Thank you very much for your kind attention. My book, Censored Landscapes, weaves together photographs, essays, poems, and in-depth research to holistically scrutinize the hidden reality of farming animals, including environmental impacts, the impact of industry practices on billions of sentient animals, including workers, human health impacts, colonization, economic impacts and inequities, and social injustice. Look for it in the fall of 2024.
So I think next we have Barbara. And, and again, thank you very much for your attention. This is such important stuff. Thank you, Isabella. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen. Um, can you see that? Good. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Lovely. Okay. Well, th thank you so much for inviting me here. It's very much appreciated. Um, basically, I'm... Uh, the founder and CEO of the Animal Interfaith Alliance. Um, the Animal Interfaith Alliance is a unique um, alliance of faith-based animal advocacy organisations, which speaks out on the moral treatment of animals by drawing on the combined wisdom of all faiths. Um, it promotes social harmony by bringing faith groups together on an issue they all share a concern with. Our activities include advocacy, animal advocacy and education. Our vision is a peaceful world where people of all faiths and none work together to treat animals with respect and compassion. And our mission is to create a united voice for animals from all of the major faiths and to bring about a world where animals are treated with respect and compassion. So I will be talking about food choices that protect the planet, um, hunting, the section on hunting. Um, and this is taken from Lisa's excellent book. Um, and she says in her book, when faced with the ecological horrors of animal agriculture, some look to hunting as an escape, as the environmentally friendly way to put meat on the table. But is that the case or is hunting just an excuse for environmental protection? So this section explores the environmental effects of hunting, exposing a handful of myths that help to make this sport appear to be environmentally friendly, animal friendly, socially acceptable and even morally exemplary. So we'll start with some facts. Today, and we're going to look at hunting in the USA to start with, and then I will look at hunting in other parts of the world. So today, less than 5% of the US population hunt. Public lands or wildlife refuges are managed on behalf of hunters, not on behalf of others who enjoy non-hunting activities such as hiking or watching wildlife. Wildlife is considered by government agencies to be a resource for hunters and is not valued in its own right. Wildlife is therefore managed for hunters. And the management of wildlife refuges is paid for by taxes on handguns, usually purchased for personal protection, but spent on hunters under the Pittman and Robertson Act. A few more facts. Um, hunting is usually for sport and rarely for subsistence or sustenance. Under wildlife conservation, hunter target species are protected and predators are exterminated. And this is unnatural. Each year, Wildlife Services kills around 2.4 million ecologically critical animals at a cost to the taxpayer of over $115 million. These include coyotes, foxes, bobcats, otters, wolves, black bears and mountain lions. And predator populations are killed with poisons, steel jaw leg hold traps, which are illegal in the European Union strangulation neck shares, snares, sorry, neck snares, denning, hounding, shooting and aerial gunning. Immunocontraceptives are not used. So why is this happening? We'll have a look at some history. So wildlife conservation was established by hunters for hunters. In the late 19th century, President Theodore Roosevelt, a hunter, set up the Boone and Crockett Club, which we'll call BCC, with the mission 
to promote the conservation and management of wildlife, especially big game and its habitat, to preserve and encourage hunting and to maintain the highest ethical standards of fair chase and sportsmanship in North America. The BCC promoted laws protecting every citizen's freedom to hunt and fish and established wildlife as owned by the people and managed in trust for the people by government agencies. This foundation for wildlife conservation continues to this day, despite less than 5% of US citizens being involved in hunting. And we have here a picture of Hubert, who has been um, inappropriately adopted by some US hunting organizations as the patron saint of hunters. This is completely wrong. Hubert was a former hunter who had a conversion and gave up hunting to become a holy man. As the legend says, he, lives, he lived in a forest in the Ardennes as a hunter. And one good Friday, when everyone else was at church, he was hunting in the forest, pursuing a magnificent stag. Suddenly, as the stag turned around, a crucifix appeared between his antlers and a voice said, Hubert, unless you turn to the Lord and lead a holy life, you shall quickly go down to hell. So Hubert dismounted his horse and prostrated himself, saying, Lord, what would you have me do? And the reply came, go and seek Lambert and he will instruct you. So Hubert went to Bishop Lambert, who became his spiritual guide, and he gave up hunting. He donated all his wealth to the poor and he studied for the priesthood, living a holy life, fasting and praying. And eventually he became the Bishop of Liege. So to use him as the patron saint of hunters is a terrible <laughs> misrepresentation um, of him. And there were plenty of other people, um, saints. We have St Melangel, who is the Welsh patron saint of animals, who rescued a hare from a hunter. Um, she's one of the most famous ones. Uh, I won't go through the story because I know we're, we're short on time. But this idea that anti-hunting is in the, the system of the saints is um, quite substantial. We have here just a few um, saints. There are many more, um, which you can find on Catholic Concern for Animals website at the um, email address or web address below. So the, for the first thousand years of Christianity, prior to Thomas Aquinas, saints cared for animals many protecting them against hunters. And the ones in this example are just a few. We have St. Basil, who greatly influenced the Eastern Church. Sorry, I'm at that. Uh, we have, sorry, St. Petroc, a Cornish saint who was an early hunt saboteur. St. Neot, he rescued deer from hunters. St Giles, a vegetarian whose sole companion was a deer whom he rescued from a hunt. St Kieran, an Irish saint who lived with and protected a boar, wolf, fox, badger, deer and many birds. St Anthony Abbott was an Egyptian hermit who healed and lived with a pig. And St Cuthbert, a Scottish hermit who shared his meals with birds and otters and, surprise, surprise, protected them from hunters. Others, we have St. Basil, who was a, a, a major influence on the Eastern Church, who said in his liturgy of St. Basil, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. O God, enlarge within us the sense of fellowship with all living things, our brothers, the animals to whom thou hast given the earth as their home in common with us. We remember with shame that in the past we have exercised the high dominion of man with ruthless cruelty, so that the voice of the earth, which should have gone up to thee in song, has been a groan of travail. May we realise that they live, not for us alone, but for themselves and for thee, and that they love the sweetness of life. Another major uh, player <laughs> um, in the, the world of saints was John of St John of Chrysostom. Um, he was a powerful influence in the Byzantine church, and he said that the saints are exceedingly loving and gentle to mankind and even to brute beasts. 
Surely we ought to show them the great kindness and gentleness for many reasons, but above all because they are the same origin as ourselves. And of course, Pope Francis in Laudato Si says clearly the Bible has no place for a tyrannical anthropocentrism, unconcerned for other creatures. Also in the Dato C, he says we must forcefully reject the notion that our being created in God's image and given dominion over the earth justifies absolute dominion over other creatures. In other faiths, we see Buddha, uh, who says all your fellow creatures are like you. They want to be happy, never harm them. And when you leave this life, you too will find happiness. The seventh Sikh guru Hare Sahib promoted the well-being of animals and protected them, setting up sanctuaries. The Emperor Ashoka was a warrior who converted to Buddhism and banned sacrifices and hunting, building animal sanctuaries and setting up edicts on non-violent behaviour carved on pillars. And the Jain Tirthankar Mahavira said, all breathing living creatures should not be slain or treated with violence, abused or tormented. This is the supreme unchangeable law. So that's our, our sort of faith-based history of how we should treat animals, which um, is, oh, sorry, <laughs> largely overlooked. So where are we today? Um, we can look at the Canadian seal hunting. Uh, many of you will remember Brian Davis, who in 1969 founded the International Fund for Animal Welfare, I4 and campaign to protect animals from hunting. He became famous for his campaign to ban the Canadian seal hunt, in which baby seals were clubbed to death in their millions for their beautiful white fur, not for food or necessary sustenance. Then in 1983, the European Parliament banned the import of seal fur, seriously limiting its market and significantly reducing the amount of seals killed. Brian also masterminded and largely financed the campaign to ban hunting with hounds in the UK through i subsidiary organisation, the Political Animal Lobby, PAL. And this legislation was achieved in 2004 with the passing of the Hunting Act. And Brian sadly died last year, aged 87, so a great loss to the movement. In the UK, um, the campaign to ban hunting with hounds um, commenced in 1991 and ended in 2004 with the passing of the Hunting Act, as I just said. Hunting with hounds was for sport, was not necessary for food or sustenance. And prior to the Act, Mori research for the League Against Cruel Sports in 2002 showed that 80% of the British public wanted a ban, as did most Labour MPs. But the ban was strongly resisted by a highly vocal minority. Um, and it's interesting to hear Alastair's talk yesterday from the plant-based universities that they'd had problems with the Countryside Alliance who had um, defeated their votes. I think it was Manchester University. Um, but it was the Countryside Alliance that was causing all the, uh, the difficulty with the Hunting Act in the UK. So today, what is our biggest problem with hunting? The biggest problem is international trophy hunting, where rich Americans and Europeans decimate Africa's wildlife for sport, frequently targeting endangered species. In the UK, the Hunting Trophies Import Prohibition Bill, Bill has just failed in the House of Lords. Again, uh, there was a majority of UK citizens and elected MPs who wanted the ban, but some members of the House of Lords, a minority, uh, turned it round. I won't go into the details because of time, but uh, as you can imagine, in the UK, we're extremely upset and disappointed about this. So finally, what are the solutions? Um, well, firstly, except where, where people need to hunt to feed themselves to survive, um, hunting should be banned. Wildlife refuges should be places that protect wildlife. They should cater for and be funded by the majority of people who enjoy non-hunting outdoor activities. 
Where necessary, wildlife population control should be undertaken using contraception, not killing. And the use of cruel trapping methods should be made illegal with the punishment of fines or imprisonments for their illegal use. And finally, if you want further reading, I can recommend a number of books on um, animals and religions, but particularly Lisa, her, if you look on her website, um, you will see she's probably written more books than everybody else put together on the subject, and I can thoroughly recommend them. You'll find all these books on the Animal Interfaith Alliance website, also a link to Lisa's uh, website there. Um, so that's me. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Greetings. Can you hear me all? Good to see you. Thank you for being here. Thank you to Isabella and Barbara. Those were great presentations. Know that they are available to share their presentations and obviously they do a fantastic job. I am going to close off the three topics that we're covering by focusing on water systems. Okay, that didn't progress the slide. Okay, there we go. Whoops, let's not get carried away. All right, so first I wanna say that I use the term animal and I do this as a matter of, of honesty. Animal includes human beings. So I use the term animal to talk about every species except the one that I belong to. And this is a term that could be used by other species as well. So it isn't, um, it isn't othering or alienating. Again, this talk is rooted in the book, Eating Earth, there on the left of the screen, but there are other books out there. Uh, the one on the right is my newest book, Vegan Ethics, and it covers all the key reasons to reconsider our diet and to go vegan. Um, Eating Earth is very cheap. You can get it for about $4 online because it's been very popular. So look for a used copy of that if you're interested in the information you're hearing here. And by the way, all of the sales from the book Amore Vegan Ethics support Tapestry. And Tapestry is the organization that I have founded in order to disseminate information, help educate and help people to know the struggles of the animals and the earth and how we can work together to bring a better world. I'm available to help anyone with any of these topics. Just let me know, just be in touch, please. All right, so I am covering water system and I'm gonna cover the fishes and fishing and water consumption and water pollution. I wanna begin with the fishes. Fishes are a little different than any other being that we talk about because they live in a different medium. When we look for fishes, this is usually what we see, maybe a bit of a splash, uh, maybe the, the sun shining back at us, opaque, maybe a flash of color underneath the surface. So fish are some, fish are some, they are beings and people that we don't know maybe as well as we might a cat or a dog or a bird or pretty much any being that lives in the same sphere that we live in. So who are these fishes? Look at this amazing being. Check out the skin on this fish. Imagine what it's like to be this being. Or maybe one of these beings. Look at that little fish. Look at the green spot on their tummy. The, imagine the feeling of their fins going through the water. Think what it's like to be looking out of those eyes. Know that these fishes are intelligent, they're social, they're sentient. They are persons. They are individuals, just like you are and just like I am. And yet these individuals are not protected by welfare laws. We see them as a mass and we generally talk about them by the pound rather than as individuals. And this brings me to the topic of fishing. Yes, we talk about them by the pound and we use indiscriminate methods to fish. And I wanna look at those and I wanna look at some of what people consider the solutions, uh, aquaculture and sustainable fishing. I am not talking, talking about indigenous fishing. 
there are many wonderful people, informed people, strong people inside indig indigenous communities that take up this topic. I'm talking to anyone who can make a choice such as I am. I'm talking to people who live roughly like I do and have uh, come from a similar culture. That's my community. And I'm also not talking about fresh water simply because most of the fish that we eat come from salt water. So know that there is just as much trouble in the fresh water and just as much trouble we have individual fishers pulling absolutely gigantic numbers of fishes from waters affecting these ecosystems and i won't talk about this much but know that this is connected and it's part of the problem that when you consume fish when you can when you see these individuals as consumable you are not only destroying a life but you're destroying ecosystems Fish are um, brought in, in in huge quantities, tons of fish. There are many, as many tons of fish are pulled out of the ocean as is the weight of the entire human population, 100 million tons. And as a result, most of the large predator fish are gone. Anything attractive that we wanted to pull out of the water is in the state of collapse. And of course, you hear in the news and you see whales washing up, penguins are starving. I was rescuing a bird uh, from a beach recently, and when I brought the bird in, they said, oh, you want to watch for the murelets now? They're the ones coming around. They're washing in because they're starving. And I looked at her and I said, do you eat fish? She didn't even seem to understand what I was saying, that our behavior is causing this problem, that the beings who depend on these fish and have no other choice are starving because we are fishing out the seas, that our choices are causing these problems. And the methods of fishing are one of the concerns. We use hooks and we use nets. Both hooks and nets are indiscriminate. That means that when you drop a net or you drop a, drop a hook into the water, you don't get to decide who gets tangled in that net or who grabs that hook. And this makes it very hard for endangered species to recover because so much of what we bring in is bycatch or bykill or what the industry calls trash. It's unintended beings, beings, living beings, unintended beings that are pulled in and killed and end up in a trash heap. And then they are often sold to animal agriculture. So you can see the connection between the fishing industry and those eating land animals and those eating the fishes and sea animals. 90% uh, of that bycatch goes to feed farmed animals, even though normally, obviously, they wouldn't be eating fishes. This is what it looks like when a hook gets lost and some of the indiscriminate um, beings, the indiscriminate suffering and killing caused. And if you look online, you can find all sorts of images of individuals caught in hooks and dying in nets. So nets, again, equally indiscriminate. Here you see a giant net just packed with living beings that have been scooped up and caught and drug along behind this boat. And again, imagine being one of those beings in that net. They are individuals. They are conscious. They are suffering. They are terrified. And they are dying. And imagine both their lives and the ecosystem from which this quantity of fish is taken by this one boat in this one moment and that this happens again and again in our seas. So here are some of the trash animals that come from ghost nets. And ghost nets are nets that escape from the boats, just like that hook that got away and ended up in that swan. These nets got away and ended up entangling sea beings unintentionally who died, the so-called bykill, bycatch, or trash. Trawlers are the primary um, bycatch killers. They have a one to five ratio for every one pound of food. There are five pounds of unintended kill. And worse among these is the shrimp industry. And they have an absolutely gigantic percentage of bykill. So for one tiny little pound of shrimp, you can have as much as 15 pounds of other beings dead. And know that fish are also responsible for the destruction of mangroves, which are essential as nurseries for sea life. 
So what do some people say solutions are? Well, some say aquaculture, but it has just as many problems as fishing without um, keeping these beings confined in miserable, filthy little pens. And the main one that I wanna to bring to mind is the final one there, that many of these fishes, for instance, salmon are carnivores. So for three years, three years, they are feeding fish to the salmon before they're killed. So it's a huge net loss of life any way you look at it. The other most common solution is the sustainable fish. And they think when people think that when they buy, they can choose to have something that is not going to harm the environment or that is tagged specifically for killing. Remember that these are individuals. When you look, when you consider the individual, there's no such thing as a sustainable kill. They're just as dead and they don't want to be any more dead than you or I want to be. But when you see these labels, just know that studies have shown that they are mislabeled a tremendous amount of the time. And one study I read, when they were trying to scientifically find out what the flesh was, they couldn't even figure out what it was. The third topic is our water consumption. Now, as Isabella pointed out, the number one use of fresh water is irrigating crops and 70% of our crops go to feeding farmed animals, 70%. In the EU, EU it is 60%. What it comes down to is that if we stopped growing crops for farmed animals, we would only need 30 to 35% of the lands under cultivation that we currently have. What a dream to return those lands to wild. I always encourage people, please never go vegetarian, go vegan. If you need to, if you, if you some way can't think you can't go vegan, then cut back on consumption of all products. Dairy has some of the greatest cruelty and some of the worst environmental harms. One, and remember these huge animals are eating and drinking to create babies and nursing milk. So one cow in one day can eat 56 pounds of grain. And that is something that a person could live on for a year. Not sustainable, not wise, not a wise use of our grains or our water. This image from Eating Earth shows how water goes into creating the foods and what they drink. So on the, the green on the top of the graph, shows what water is necessary to create food for each of these species and the bottom shows what they actually drink. The line, the horizontal line up top is the flow of the annual, the annual flow of the Amazon River, which has more flow than any other river. So if you look at this graph, you can see that the consumption, the water consumption of these four species, and that's not all the species, in one year is nearly the flow of four Amazon rivers for an entire year. Four years of Amazon water flow is what they are consuming. Small wonder that our aquifers are running dry and our rivers are running dry. Sorry, our aquifers are going dry and some of these we can't refill them and our rivers are running dry. And remember when you look at a river and see it dry, you're, you may only think, oh my goodness, the water's gone. But think of the ecosystem that's gone. Think of the beings who lived here, who depended on that river, not just the ones in the river, but all around on this dry landscape, all of the beings who came to that river for their needs, for whatever their needs were for water, gone. Where I lived in Montana, there was a gigantic ditch that ran very near to my house. And there, were, there are ditches all over Wyoming and Montana and the region where they pull water, and near me it was from the Yellowstone River, huge quantities from the Yellowstone and other water sources, and run them around in order to water these grain crops and, these, uh, and the cattle industry, which is very large in that area. And again, you can see here the devastation to the environment. If you care about water shortages, fresh water, the shortages, the fear of the future that we're going to run out of water, there is no question that the best choice of a diet is going to be vegan. All right, the final topic is pollution, our water pollution. 
So all of these beings consuming all of these grains and all of this water, well, what goes in must come out. And I had a friend in Montana who just hated cattle. He hated them for what they did to the environment. And of course, he was eating hamburgers and anything else, that, all the other, he was eating meat right, left and center and dairy. He didn't seem to get the connection between where he was spending his money and what he was swallowing and the earth that he did care very dearly about. We have to make that connection. Here is a gigantic hill that somebody might love to ski down. If I could ski, I might consider that, but I might hike up it, except for the trouble that this is actually not a beautiful mountain. It is a pile of manure with greenhouse gases coming off it. And in the end, a pile of manure that affects the entire environment around it. When we have this many land animals, we have a tremendous amount of waste. So again, here's another image from Eating Earth showing exactly what that waste amounts to for these four species. It is roughly, I would say looking at those, a little more than three annual flows of the Hudson River, which is 300 miles long. One more thing. Um, well, we'll talk about it here. So the lagoons, you can see here up atop the lagoons that this waste is kept in. When there is a storm, those lagoons overfill. You can see that one on the left. Imagine a hurricane. Imagine a couple days of rain. That water is going to escape. It's going to leak out. It's going to get into the environment. On the right, you can see them pulling uh, the slurry out of the lagoon. Uh, on another lagoon, and then down below you see what they do with it. So here is a field, it looks positively saturated, and they're spreading more poop onto the field. Well, what are you to do? You've got, you've got a lot of poop, you've got a lot of animals that we're raising for our exploitation, for our consumption, and all of that poop has to go somewhere. And the best solution that most of these uh, farmers and ranchers come up with is to reuse it on fields. The trouble is, the rains come, that poop washes into the water system. It, it brings a, a richness because of the nature of manure and algae blooms grow. And as these algae blooms die, they consume oxygen. But the beings in the water need oxygen. So this is what happens. You end up with dead zones. Here's a graph showing how with the consumption, with, these, with the growth of these giant animal agriculture facilities, is the growth of dead zones. And you see this ends in 2006. And I know that when in about 2000, you can see it jumped. Um, and this is about the time that people started to actually hear, start to hear the word dead zone. But still today, many people don't know what a dead zone is. And yet now there are more than 400 dead zones, 100,000 square miles, uh, 8,000 8, square miles in the Gulf of Mexico from our own uh, Mississippi River in um, that runs through the Midwest. Here is what that looks like. Look at how the, it almost looks like shining, glistening, beautiful waters. But it's fish, individuals, individuals who died because we polluted the water eating what we eat. Here's another in China. And look at the many individuals that have died and one in South America and one in Florida. Remember that you can just see this as a mass, but these are these are living individuals. Each one of them is a person who died because of our choices. And remember that this is only part of it. This is only one of the pollutants that we add, that we have pollutants that we add because we're raising crops, monocultures for these uh, farmed animals. So we have the chemical fertilizers, the pesticides, the solvents, the, the things that we use to clean in the slaughterhouses, the blood, the fat, the, the hair, all of this gets into the water system. And while we clean our water system and we worry very much about our own water purity, what about this little being? What about her and her family? She lives in that water that we're sucking up and destroying. Water looks beautiful. You look at it and, and it, is, it is still marvelous to see in areas where it is still clean. 
but it is in a state, state of silent collapse because of what omnivores and vegetarians are choosing to eat. Our dietary choices are destroying ecosystems in the oceans and in water bodies and the water bodies themselves. Remember the importance of oceans, that they are an absolutely huge, tremendous space. And in that space is an, a gigantic quantity of life, much of which we don't even know, but we are somewhat distant from it. We don't we don't see and interact with sea life the way we often do with land beings, but they are extremely important. And so is the water itself for oxygen and for helping us with the climate change problem that we have created. What can we do? We have to know, we have to understand how our choices affect the world around us. And then we need to make appropriate choices, which means go vegan, please don't go vegetarian please go vegan. And then we need to educate others. We need to speak out and we need to do it for their homes because this is where they live and they don't have anywhere else to be. And we need to do it for their communities because they live in communities and care about their lives just as much as we care about our lives. And they have just as much a reason to be here and a love of their being here as we do. We need to change our diet, yes, because we care about the earth, yes, because we care about one another, but we need to recognize that we aren't the only beings that matter on this planet. They matter too. They love their lives just as we love our lives. Thank you. <clears throat> and by way of conclusion for all three presentations, <clears throat> let me just say that oftentimes People will go from one, one eating, one form of eating to another. But at the end of the day, you can't just decide, well, okay, eating cattle is a problem. I'm going to eat chickens. No, eating chickens is just as much of a problem. And you can't say, well, I'll eat the fish. No, eating the fish is also a problem. And you can't hunt. Hunting destroys wildlife and it destroys wildlife ecosystems with the power and the dollars of governments. And that's not just the United States, that's worldwide. So please be informed. And when you are informed, you need to change. And I will say this, you can be uninformed or insincere and call yourself an environmentalist and continue to be an omnivore or vegetarian. But what you can't do is be sincere and informed, call yourself an environmentalist and be anything but vegan. Thank you very much.